My name is Bill Pachaki. I've been in the pet industry for almost 50 years. We do nutritional counseling, we do health, real health for our pets. Uh, we have several different companies that work on this, both from the manufacturing standpoint of different herbs and botanicals. Uh, we also manufacture and process raw and cooked meat diets for our carnivore friends. Uh, the whole goal is to keep them healthy. With that being said, I wanted to talk a little bit for, first off because this is Heartworm Awareness Month. And of course, we're in South Florida and everybody is concerned about parasites. However, some of the protocols that we've seen out there aren't exactly what we need to do. Basically, good health, keeping our, our pets worm free, heartworm free, uh, flea free, starts with nutrition. We have to have a good, strong immune system for the body to be able to naturally shed these parasites. Parasites are all around us. There's a lot of misgivings and a lot of misinformation about where they come from. Heartworms come and are transmitted by mosquitoes. However, it's only one species of mosquitoes, one, that transmits it. And your dog has got to be bit by several that are infected because we still need a male and a female heartworm in order to breed inside the body. Now, one of the things I, I, talk, I, I mention when I do these talks about the mosquitoes themselves, we think it's a big problem, but I always, always ask professionals, when was the last time you were bit by a mosquito on the top of your head? Mosquitoes don't like fur or hair. They can't get down to the skin level. What are our dogs and cats covered in? Hair. So the chances of them getting them are actually in nature, less than 3% of the time. That means wild, wild dogs, coyotes, wolves, all of that, less than 3% ever get heartworms. And the other myth is that it takes, it, it actually takes eight to 10 years for heartworms to kill an animal. It's not an immediate thing. There is no such thing as a preventative. Any of the products that you use are actually putting and treating for something your dog doesn't have. That becomes an issue because we're putting toxins into the body, which is going to hurt that immune system. It's going to drive it down. Now they're more susceptible to it. It's the same thing, that, of course, in the news lately, we've all heard about the, the measles breakouts and all of that. Most of the people that have come down with that disease have been vaccinated because the vaccines really don't do any work. But every time we put something else into the body that contains toxins, we lower that immune system. So vaccinations, medications, the chemicals in the air, spraying for mosquitoes, the spraying for Zika, the chemtrails. Um, and in fact, one of the worst ones today is Roundup glyphosate because that is actually not a weed killer that is actually an everything killer it's an antibiotic so it's killing off all the good bacteria in the gut that we need to be able to absorb our food so and then we look at the diets if we're not doing a species appropriate diet which in a carnivore would be meat okay then we're not giving them optimal nutrition to start with and then if we can't digest it, if we have what's known as malnutrition or malabsorption disease, then we have this issue going on. So we have to keep building it up as much as we can. Again, one of the other things we throw into the mix, of course, is spay and neuter. Because we're taking a part of the endocrine system out, that creates issues. The body's got to work overtime to still make those hormones that the body needs. So it's, it's a matter of balancing a whole body for health in order to keep our animals parasite free. Things like roundworms, where do they come from? The soil. Hookworms the same way. Tapeworms come from fleas. And of course there's all, all, all kinds of other parasites and protozoa and that sort of thing that they can pick up from drinking out of puddles, the grass itself, eating it, laying in it. You know, they're picking up different things all over the place. So again, we go back to this, the same thing. How do we build that body? How do we build that immune system? 
Well, we, build, we start out with the basic building blocks. Let's face it, our dogs and cats are carnivores. Funny looking jungle cats, funny looking wolves. What do they eat in the wild? They don't eat fruits or vegetables. You don't see pictures on National Geographic of wolves picking apples or digging up carrots or sweet potatoes. They eat just strictly animal parts is what they're basically looking at. It's a, a wide variety of different things that they eat. They do need things like poultry they, and birds. They do need big meats, deer, beef, things of that nature, fish, and of course, eggs. Because eggs are one of the easiest things for them to steal in the wild. It's an easy meal. That's why I joke around about the foxes never went in a, in a hen house to get the chickens. They were in there for the eggs. They were just so easy to get. So we start out with their digestive tract being designed only to break down animal fats and proteins. We as humans, as an omnivore, we have what's known as alamase, an enzyme in our saliva that starts the digestive uh, breakdown of carbohydrates. Dogs and cats don't have that. Look at their teeth, they're not designed for chewing. They're designed for grabbing, tearing, and swallowing. So, and you know, I hear pet owners all the time, my dog doesn't chew his food. Well, in nature, they don't. <laughs> they don't have those grinding teeth. Cows have the grinding teeth. So, when we, we feed them a carbohydrate-based diet, which is primarily almost all the commercial foods out there, we're actually putting that food into the stomach without the proper digestive enzyme. Now, the body's going to make alamase, a pseudo-alamase product. But, if we have spay and neuter, we're already taxing the endocrine system, making other things that they're not supposed to, the pancreas, the thyroid, and, and the adrenal gland, things of that nature. So now we're making pseudo-alamase in that little tiny pancreas, instead of the lipase and the protease that they need to break down animal fats and proteins. The other thing is, is when, we, when carnivores eat carbohydrates, it converts into sugar. Now that pancreas is also making a lot of extra insulin. One of, the, one of the challenges I see in the veterinary field today, so many dogs are coming down with pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas. Why? Because it's making the pseudo-LMase and it's making a ton of insulin that it shouldn't have to do. So the closer to that primal, species appropriate meat diet we can stay, the healthier animals are going to be. Uh, going to be. Now, obese animals come into that same category because when those dogs and cats start eating carbohydrates and converts into sugar, that follows being converted into fat. So now we've got all these obese and, and overweight animals that are out of balance. That starts creating all kinds of skeletal problems. It starts creating all kinds of intestinal problems, digestive problems. When I started in the business, Basically, there was no, we never saw cancer. We never saw diabetes. We never saw allergies. We never saw dental problems. These are all brought on by our modern practices. We also never saw a vet, except when we got a brand new puppy, and got one rabies shot and maybe a distemper shot. We didn't have scientifically formulated foods. We fed what, what was on our plates and extra that we made for them. As a kid, when my parents needed to have extra food for the dog, I went to the butcher shop. He would reach in his scrap barrel, put a bunch of it on, on the paper like they used to and wrap it up, tie it with a string. We took it home, we fed some of it raw, we cooked some of it, and the reason we started cooking it is because our refrigeration back in the 1950s wasn't as good as it is today. So that gave it extended shelf life. And even if, you know, if we did go back to a vet, it was usually as a result of an injury or an accident. Our dogs were living 20 years plus back then. In fact, my very first job in the industry, out of college, was in a shepherd kennel up in upstate New York. 150 German shepherds. We had everything. Guard dogs, military dogs. We had service dogs, we had puppies. Anything that you wanted in German Shepherds, they were on property. 150 of them, 1971. Including we had a couple of retired World War II veteran dogs. 1971, 
Those shepherds were almost 30 years old. Now you might say, how did they live so long back then? Well, they were actually born before kibble. They were fed meat. That's what the primary thing was. Some of, them, some of the, the breeders that would use a little bit of what was in a meal, it wasn't this extruded food in the shape, but that was a filler. Just like in our diet, we had things like rice and pasta and you know, other various lower cost items as bulk. So that being said, the closer we can get back to our, again, the basic nutrition, not only the healthier that they're gonna be, but we're also going to have longevity and longevity without suffering. You know, think, think about some of the skeletal problems that we see, especially in big dogs, things like hip dysplasia um, and all the joint pains, the arthritis, all of that. Those all have nutritional components to them. In fact, hip dysplasia, while they've been telling us for the last 20, 30 years it's genetic, they have been looking and researching hip dysplasia, looking for the genetic link for over 60 years, and they cannot find it. But there's over 10,000 individual studies and papers that have been written tying it directly to dry foods. Because when those bones are growing, and it, when we stop and think about it, it's so logical. When these dogs are growing, they go through growth spurts. We're all, we're all familiar with that. Well, when we feed carbohydrates, that converts into fat. So when those long bones start to grow and need to, need to move, muscle stretches, but fat doesn't. So we're actually restricting that fast growth with that fat built on there. The second part of that problem is because it's carbohydrates and fat, there's no muscle to hold that joint together. And of course with dry foods, there's no oil, so there's no, no lubrication. So that ball and socket doesn't quite meet. Now I've got a loose bearing that wears it down. The good news is, is that actually we can rebuild those bones just through nutrition. I've had fights with a lot of people in the industry on the, on the medical side that you can't regrow bone. Well, we know that our bones are continuously changing as we in our own life, same with the dogs. But I always ask them, if you can't grow no new bones, what happens when I break my arm and you put it in a cast? At that point, I'm usually dismissed, you know, get out of my office type of thing. But so much of this is, is common sense. All we have to do is go back and look at what they do in nature. Where do they get their food? How do they get their food? They actually will hunt different areas because they have cravings. They know exactly what their body needs at any given time. Ours, our bodies do exactly the same thing. Um, you know, it's a matter of, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, nat it's a natural way that we tie the whole thing together. Um, so, you know, the basis is, is that we want to start out keeping our animals healthy. That means parasite-free, disease-free, dis-ease. We want health. Where do you get health information? You gotta seek that out. It's a lot, not as easy as going to a veterinarian or an animal hospital because they know medicine, not health. They don't study health at all. So, to wrap it up, if you want a healthy animal, you want them to be optimal, you want them to be active, you want them to inter interact with you a lot better in behavior-wise. You start out with the basics of the diet. And uh, we, we're, I'm gonna be here in, in the hall. I'll be over at the Fiesta Pet Deli, the Pet Health Cafe, um, answering questions over there today. And, you know, I've been doing this, like I said, for almost 50 years. So I have a lot of information, I can answer your questions. I think I've witnessed everything with transitioning diets and what the animals literally go through. So I'm there for, for you guys. Um, come over, they got, I know they got a lot of specials over there as well today. So everything that they do, all by, the, by the way, is all human grade and all made in their own facility. So we look forward to seeing you over there. Thank you for your time and hopefully we'll talk.